As was just explained, I am a professor of urban planning, and it may seem a little odd that I'm here to talk about urban education. But it happened because of a class I took almost 50 years ago as I began graduate school. And I became enthralled with the quest for trying to reduce poverty in our urban areas. And as I was on that quest, I took several more classes. And then I began to evaluate the war on poverty, Lyndon Baines Johnson's big effort to reduce poverty. And we quickly learned that it didn't matter how effective that program was. It was so small compared to both the problem and other parts of the solution. So another lesson we learned is one that I've really stuck with me. And most of you would come to the same conclusion without doing a federally sponsored program. Uh, and that is that employment is the best route out of poverty. That's pretty simple. But then you look at it a little further and you say, well, there are two components to that. In order to increase employment, we need to increase the number of jobs. And if you've done any looking at recent uh, years of announcements on jobs, we haven't done a very good job of creating jobs. But job creation is one piece. The second piece is creating a, an educated workforce. So as I continued in my graduate work, I wrote a dissertation on job creation and have continued in various ways involved in that activity at UWM. And education, I began to look at much more closely once I arrived in Milwaukee and began to see what was happening in urban education. One of the earliest lessons I learned was in that first seminar on poverty. And that is that we as adults learn more than half our vocabulary by age three. That's pretty incredible and talks about how important those early years are. In recent years, actually in the 80s, we had another study that revealed that those who come from higher income families hear 30 million more words by age four than their low income counterparts. Incredible difference, very difficult to overcome. And yet, we do find some who overcome that enormous difference, that slower start. Why is that? Well, they have been able to find their ways to quality schools. And it would be terrific if we could create more of these quality schools. And that's one of the quests I've been on, is trying to figure out what is it that matters in education? How do you get higher quality schools? So one of the most obvious things we ought to talk about is teachers. Do teachers matter? Do high quality teachers matter? And I'll try to convince you. If you haven't already been convinced by hopefully you've had the experience to have high quality teachers, maybe not every year, but some years, and there is a difference. You do learn more. I did a number of studies which helped reinforce this uh, to me. One, I led a study of 25,000 elementary students from first to sixth grade, trying to look at what really matters, what really most affects uh, educational achievement. And interestingly, we proved what many others have seen, that there are a number of factors which are associated with higher or lower levels of uh, student achievement. Higher income tended to achieve more than lower income. Females do better than males. Whites do better than minorities. Those who attend school more often do better than those who uh, attend less often. And those who perform well early tend to perform well later. But this study was really aimed at whether we could identify teachers that made a difference. And knowing what we did about students, we projected as to how much they should learn in a given year in a given classroom. And we found that with that, we found teachers whose students had a regu regularly learned more than expected given what we knew about those students. And that was heartening to find. There are a majority of teachers 
who added about what we expected, given what we knew about those students. And then, unfortunately, there was a sizable group of teachers whose students did not learn as much as would be expected, given what we'd seen at previous performance. Another look that I took was at other countries. Annually, there are lots of stories on these are the 10 countries in which students are learning the most, highest achieving. Are there similarities? And I identified and was able to travel to three of these countries to examine what commonalities there were. I happened to go to Finland, Ireland, and Singapore. And interestingly, all of them have several characteristics exactly the same. One is the teachers come from the top 10 to 20% of college graduates. That is not true in the United States. Secondly, they began their college education program in schools, doing learning how to teach in kindergarten or fifth grade or 10th grade. So they had four years of experience, if they should last that long, uh, before they were graduated and put on the job. What that did is also uh, convince some that they were not going to be great teachers and that they ought to find another occupation. And they did it early. They didn't find out fourth semester of the senior or last semester of senior year that this isn't what they want to do. Thirdly, they're paid well. Again, something that isn't so true today in the United States. And fourth, they were respected in the classroom and respected by society. They were really put on a pedestal and it made a great difference. Education itself was valued by a large part of the population. Another set of studies I've done is on curriculum. You've all been through and probably had different curriculums depending on what's in vogue at the time, thinking that this will make the difference. And I've monitored and evaluated several what I thought were very good curriculums. One is Project Lead the Way, a pre-engineering curriculum for STEM uh, that uh, helps. It's a project-based education that is done very well. It's highly regarded, and I've, I was very impressed by it. But when you look at it across different schools, you find out that it is not a universal panacea, that in the schools that the students do better, Project Lead the Way has a greater impact. In the schools which less learning is going on, Project Lead the Way doesn't make much of a difference. Also looked at a curriculum, a early childhood curriculum called direct instruction which is a fairly structured way of learning and learning math and reading. And it's teachers work with small groups of individuals. And in many schools, it had, they were able to get higher levels of learning with that. But at one of the schools I was monitoring, most of the teachers made reading fun, went into a classroom and happened to coincide with teachers saying, all right, children, let's do some reading. Tears all over the classroom. This was not going to work. The teacher made a huge difference. Another way I looked at uh, teachers uh, was uh, th through, uh, wouldn't you know, <laughs> yeah. OK, well, I end with that. Teachers matter. Second ingredient, principles. They matter a great deal as well. When I was in elementary school and high school, I thought of principles. They had one assignment, discipline. That's where you went if you misbehaved. I have since learned, as have many others, that principles make a great difference. They hire the staff. They retain the staff. They inspire the staff. They set stretch goals for the staff. They bring in resources be they volunteers or additional funds, they are what make the schools really work. They hire, maintain, inspire, cajole, so forth, keep the teachers performing at high levels, bringing students with them. When we look at uh, schools, and I've seen, I've been in dozens and dozens of schools, 
Some of these schools have really struck me. One is in Milwaukee. It's now a charter school called Milwaukee College Prep. The principal there started with the school in its heyday. They rehabbed, I think it was an old factory building. And the population that came to that school was basically low income, single family, uh, not a great deal of support from the parents about education. That school today is four different buildings. When I've run uh, teacher focus groups, they have struck me as an incredibly well-informed, research-based, active, engaged, excellent teacher core, and the results show that. Another uh, program, a school I was in, uh, had the similar results. Challenging conditions, and yet, principal was able to pull together a teacher core lead and get uh, astounding results. We look at whether we can do things to strengthen our teacher core, and one of the programs was, that was tried was teacher or principal coaching. Just many business people today have coaches helping them develop the skills so that they make better decisions. Uh, inspire their workers to a greater degree. This can work, has worked in, in schools, but there are two ingredients needed. One are good coaches, and we see the difference as we look at uh, games on television. And then secondly, individuals willing to learn, willing to be coached. We don't always get that combination. But it's clear that principles matter a great deal. Got another uh, in critical ingredient, parents. Many of you recognize that. Uh, all of us should. Uh, one of the studies I did was you know, trying to correlate student achievement with uh, level of uh, parental involvement, clearly. The more parents were involved, the better the students did. It didn't matter whether they were involved at school, volunteering, whether they were talking to the teachers at home from the, by the phone only, or whether they were working with you and others uh, at home. Format didn't matter, the fact of involvement did. I have one more P on my list of what matters. This may surprise you. Physical activity. Today we hear a lot more about physical activity because of increase in diabetes and overweight, more overweight children. But much more fundamentally, physical activity creates synapses in our brain, neural pathways that are critical to learning. We see a lot of students who are very good on their Xboxes but they can't read across a page because they have not done activities that require them to work both sides of the body at the same time. Went through a school with another professor. We dragged a wrestling mat down the hall and we had certain uh, students come out of each classroom. And we found that those who could not crawl, which seems pretty fundamental, couldn't read very well. Those who couldn't sit on their butt and go across the mat uh, without using their hands, I call it scooching, don't, don't re read well. Those who can't do a wheelbarrow, human wheelbarrow on the hands, don't read well. After a series, months of uh, movement, these students' reading scores gain dramatically. Proof of the importance of physical activity. Another set of research that I was not involved with, but that I certainly followed, of French schools divided their classrooms in half. One group spent lots of time on their intellectual development, reading and math. Another group had 25% less time on task, but spent that in physical activity. Which group do you think did better? Well, you're getting the... <laughs> Well, it, it isn't really physical activity, it's they both did equally well, but it also, they came back a lot happier, a lot less jumpy. Uh, 
So <laughs> learning could go on, and they had the neural pathways to speed that up. So physical activity is very important. If we look across what we're doing in urban education these days, what are we doing? We're ignoring, for the most part, early childhood development. We are eliminating physical education, physical activity. We're dissing teachers and principals. And we're exploring a variety of curricula. We try them for two years, three years, and throw them out and say, that didn't work. Well, we have some explanation. So what do we do? In my ideal world, what we would do is support very high quality early childhood education from the earliest years possible for everyone. Unfortunately, that's very expensive. But we've had experiments with this. Studies have been done. And we find that the cost of that high quality preschool is much less than the costs that are created by not doing that. So if we look at 12 years of remedial education classes, uh, low graduation rates resulting in low earning incomes, we look at crime and the costs of incarceration, we look at the costs of higher levels of alcohol and drug abuse, you add those up and it's much higher by factors of three to 10 times higher than what it would cost to do early, high quality early childhood education. But in this environment, as Mike just indicated, it's a tough sell, uh, investing in education. What else can we do? Well, some districts have done this to varying degrees. The earlier we can start public education, the better. Three-year-old kindergarten, four-year-old kindergarten, helping overcome some of that uh, initial uh, lack of exposure to uh, words and numbers. If we can't do that, let's try that one. But the least we can do is do uh, more coaching of parents. There are experiments these days going on showing that parents do want to learn more about how they can interact, how they can add more value, how they can increase the learning for their children. And, are active in this. We ought to try and do that on a much larger scale. And certainly we should remember physical activity, not just for early uh, childhood, but for our entire lives. Here at UWM, uh, you have an opportunity to get involved. And one of the things that we learned in that experiment, which said that we learned 30 million more words, higher income than lowest income. One of the critical ingredients wasn't just the hearing of the words. TV, you could be on, you could hear lots of words, doesn't do anything. What it takes is personal interaction, looking someone else in the eye, interacting. You could play a role in this while you're here at UWM. We have Hartford University School, middle of campus, you can volunteer as a tutor or as a big brother or big sister, make that connection and make a difference in some student lives and you'd probably your own as well. Thank you.